I turn on the recorder. Right. Welcome, welcome. Amen. I'm writing it, Lavinia, in. Okay. We can start with a prayer. Anybody want to pray? I'll pray. I'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your great love and thank you for who you are and who you're becoming to me and others who are learning the truths of the mm -hmm. Father and the Son, the only begotten Son that you have so graciously given. Yes. Father, I ask your God that you, by your spirit, be here. Um, thank you so much for this time that, that it's possible to get together like this even though we're all so far apart physically right now. Thank you so much for your promises. And I pray that you would just be with each of us and um, help us all to come closer to you and to become more like you and to draw closer together, all mm -hmm. of us. Thank you in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. How are you? Good. How are you? Hello, Hi, Lorraine. Hi. Good to see you. Looks like you got your study book right there, boy. I have my my Bible and I was doing some of my garden journaling oh, okay. when Lorraine texts me. <laughs> Have a Bible. Any questions, any testimony? We'll work from there. You look like you're going to the scripture with your question. Well, I was just going to, I don't have any questions. I can think of off hand um well I do have one but um I came to Hebrews I was telling you that I just started studying Hebrews and so um and I've kind of been doing like the sanctuary study off and on also mm -hmm. I was continuing in that the other day but um I guess my question was does does Christ, you know how it talks about um, the Lord being crucified afresh. So I guess I needed to understand what um, the role of, I guess, sin in that, how, what happens when we sin? Because I understand that Jesus made a sacrifice for us but when I was, that's what prompted me to go to Hebrews. Uh oh, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Okay, that's what prompted me to go to Hebrews, um, so I could understand. Oh, excuse me, one second. My son's calling. Hold on. Okay. Um sorry about that um so i went to hebrews and i keep finding it says once and he made a sacrifice for like once i keep seeing the repetitive word once once he like he made the sacrifice once he sent to heaven sat down on the right hand of god and so you know like i've heard it say pastors will say like oh every time we sin we crucified jesus afresh and so i didn't understand that i've always i always thought that to be true but then as i was reading i saw that um in verse six uh, chapter six it says um yeah chapter hebrews six verse four 
It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So this particular scripture is referring to falling away from Christ as crucifying him afresh. Well, when I go to like, um, I don't know, I don't, I can't tell exactly where it is at the moment, but there's all throughout here, the book of Hebrews, like you see that they say, oh, okay, by the which we will, chapter 10, verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And I just keep seeing once, once, once. So like, you know how in the, the Israelites in the, um, for their sacrifice, they had, or for their sins, they had to continually sacrifice an offering every single time they sinned. And the reason being from what I understand in my sanctuary study is because the blood of the ram and the goats and everything could not take away the sin of they couldn't it couldn't really offer it was just a a shadow of you know what was to come like with jesus the whole point of the ceremonial sacrificial system was for that they could for they to, for them to understand about jesus so it wasn't that they took away the the sin by the sacrifices so that would kind of led me to think also like well so if Jesus does take away the sin, if he is the true and spotless, since he is a true and spotless lamb without blemish, then every time we sin, he's not being crucified. How is he continuing to be crucified over and over and over again if he keeps saying once and once? And what would necessitate a continual crucifying of him if he doesn't need, if, since he meets the requirement there's not a ne it's not necessary for multiple times for him to be a crucified once hmm. yeah from what you're talking about there that's like a sense of um evaluation. i'm sorry what? go ahead i said from what you're talking about it comes from a sense of devaluing what he did in the sense that that blood that was shed was sufficient that you don't have to continue sh um, shedding it. Um, the biggest thing that I come to understand now, which helps to unlock scripture, is, excuse me, first to um, know who God is because it says beginning of wisdom is to know God and when we have a, a false understanding of who God is it makes it more difficult to extract what is being communicated by the scripture so like you first one on that scripture where you talk about lamb slain before the foundation of the earth and um, his sacrificial blood. The way to like validate that those things are so and how it branches off into the other ideas that we've been taught and so forth is to understand the position of Christ and the value and validity of what that entails. Um, I've been doing a study or I don't remember if I actually got the study, but I was taking note of um, begottenness of him 
and when I frame my mind according to what that is expressing, I come to find out <clears throat> to, or let me put it like this. Because of the sin, there were certain things that had to qualify to eradicate the sin. And those things had to be checked off by Christ for him to be that go between in that order of what was necessary to make it happen, to be our redemption and our savior and the lamb slain. There's certain qualifications that he has to meet what I would say prior to when he was in the presence physically here and the death and the resurrection, all those different um, concepts helps you to unlock all these uh, ideas that you're trying to grasp for a better understanding. So if I'm to go chronological, which I find that that's the best way to gather all the information of truth, that you can follow the streamline of the whole idea. So in John 3, 16, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, what is being taught in the nominal mainstream Adventism, they're telling you that begottenness comes at the time when he came in the babe in the manger. But according to um, the context and the tense of the language in that scripture, that's impossible because it says that he gave him, so that means he had to already have him to give it to him, give it to the world. So this leads us to the understanding that Christ was begotten in heaven. Uh, you have some people, I guess you could say, they basically try to change the meaning of begotten. But if you go throughout the Bible and you go in your dictionary, begotten is going to tell you that it either means brought forth or they'll just make it simple and tell you to be born. So the concept there is Christ was born in heaven. And gathering that understanding, what that does for the salvation of plan is qualify that <clears throat> anybody that receive of him, or I should, no, I shouldn't say it like that. I should say this. If Christ is the salvation, and it's to be given to someone that was never always in existence. Um, he had to be in a position where he fully can relate to us in the sense that um, he has a beginning. Because if we're to do like what the Trinity says, it's going to tell you that he always exists, which if you believe in the, the death and resurrection, that's already a problem right there without even going back to the beginning. So if we're going to go by what the words are expressing in the context of the definition by the love of the etymology, we would understand that he was born in heaven and everything that the father was, he was. So his existence 
of his own personality having a beginning has nothing to disqualify him from not being able to be eternal. And what it really does is it kind of set him up on the special, um, I don't want to say privilege, but it has to come from the, the concept of that word in the sense that he's the only one that could ever fit this um, criteria because no one else can fit this criteria. By him being begotten, it means that he is made from the substance of the Father. So his physical structure in heaven prior to coming here was everything of his father. That mean the glory, that mean the spirit that the father had is now given to the son. And where the Bible talks about partaking of the divine nature, this is what it's talking about. You, you gain in his spirit. It's a, um, if you will, like a matriculation from the father to the son in revelation one to tell you it went to the angel and the angel to john and everybody that reads the word of john you receive that same spirit so that's how it matriculates down and when you even go as far as him being brought forth because he said that himself too he was brought forth from the bosom of the father. There's a quote in Spirit of Prophecy where she talks about torn from the bosom, the only begotten of the father. So taking in that concept where it told us that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the, of the world, that fits perfectly to me in the sense that you would consider that being the first surgery. Although many other people would say like the Adam and Eve situation was the first surgery. But then <clears throat> we have a concept of the Bible where it tells us whatever happened in, on the earth, it's a type in heaven as well. So when you take it from that perspective, you see that all these things are setting the groundwork and foundation to train our mind and our eyes to catch the appropriate message that's being expressed. Um, I know that's kind of like draw, drawn out with answer as far as what you're asking for, but I see that that is a major um, blockage for the most part with understanding a lot of things. And the more of the receiving and understanding of that portion, it unlocks a whole lot of stuff. Did that confuse you more or you starting to see? Well, um, I guess I just thought that with the question that I had about, I felt like maybe I should study my sanctuary alongside the book of Hebrews mm -hmm. so that there is a clear understanding of what I guess what I'm trying to find out is what and I know the answer in part I think but not like my my question is where 
since he was crucified, they say like, okay, he's in heaven interceding. So all of our sins are transferred to the heavenly sanctuary, which he's cleansing right now. He's cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. So all our sins are, are laid there. So that still leaves me with them. So what happens when we sin? Since he was already crucified once, is he crucified afresh? Because that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says when we fall away from him, he's crucified afresh. And the scriptures keep talking about a once and for all sacrifice. So since he did that, he sacrificed and ascended to heaven, into the most holy place to plead his blood in an in intercession for us. Then what happened? Like I guess I guess I want to know the the how can I say it? The process of what happens exactly when we sin. Like what does that really look like? And again, I feel like I know the answer in theory, but I wanna un, I want to see it like much more. I want it to be like very transparent. Like I want to understand like what happens. Is it laid upon Jesus or Jesus or is it just laid upon the altar? And I don't know. Uh, it's my words are just <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. I don't understand the sanctuary as much as I need to. I mean, I do understand. Like I said, I understand the basic components of the sanctuary. I mean, yeah, as yeah. far as like, I under like I understand about the the sacrifices with the Israelites. Like I said, I understand generally that and what it represents in Christ's intercession in heaven and things like that. But it's just. I guess on a surface level is what I'm saying. Um, is I understand it in the, on a surface level. I would agree with that because um, the, the the other thing about it is that like the sanctuary doctrine per se, like what you're bringing out there, it's so vast that. You got to take, mm. like, you know, you get a plate of food, you can put a lot of stuff on the plate, but you don't take all of it in at one time. So you have to kind of take bite sizes and knock it down strategically. And mm -hmm. just on a visual, like, just like searching through my mind, one of the major things that we should do, you know, without even really having to go deep in the scripture or anything like that, is to look at how everything is arranged. Look at the furniture. Identify what it represents. And it's kind of like um, when we deal with like uh, beasts and stuff like that. Like we talk about a lamb. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to study the behavior of a lamb so you can really catch communication why that particular beast was chosen and what is it that is really trying to transfer of information to us. So when you start going one by one by all the different things of the sanctuary, you see it's a lot of stuff not really being um, take note of to help us to unlock, you know, whatever our questions are, because we will gain more validity. But without even getting into, you know, like, doctrinal scriptures and everything like that, I would say that just in simplicity, that if I was dealing with a third grade level child, I would tell you that when you sin, there is a separation between you and Christ that you can't 
like be in the room with the father. And that's where you are, if you're in a conscious state, meaning a sense of awareness of your sin, so to speak, it would cause you to become um, a sense of guilt. Now, I will go to the garden where the original um, to mankind of sin transpired. What it did was it caused where they felt a sense of a darkness in the sense that they could not be drawn to Christ's light, that <clears throat> now they covered up and uh, looked to hide because that sense of guilt caused them to be ashamed. Um, I was telling the rain, I think today and yesterday, where the guilt, it can work on you two different ways. The guilt can rise up to the point where you just say there's no hope. There's no need for me to continue living because God is not going to save me. And you believe the lie of the devil and commit suicide and take yourself out. Or <clears throat> you can receive that guilt and say, look, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But I have an advocate that is like you say, an officiate in heaven with the sins and know that I can go to the throne and ask for forgiveness and be restored back to the righteousness of his son. And that makes you free and clear all over again. Um, I'm here thinking about what you're saying as far as the sins in heaven I don't think it's like, like your physical, like whatever you committed as a sin is there. I think it's the recordings of your sin because there's a book in heaven that is recording everything. But um, once you approach um, the throne of grace and asking for forgiveness and repenting of your sin, then it's like he wipes that slate clean. And the remembrance is not of his. The remembrance is you bring it back up. You um, receive of the guilt of, of Satan. No, receive of the, the unbelief of Satan that you go into another state of guilt and doubting that God has freed you from that sin. And so you're walking in a mindset of guilt and shame because of your unbelief. Therefore, that's why the scripture that tells you said, help my unbelief because we only gain faith by hearing the word of God. So when you put all these things together, this is what keeps us connected to the Father through through the Son. We gone where it's like under nine minutes now left. So I mean okay. I'm not like pounding you with yeah, I mean, right now but it's trying to develop a concept with the foundation of some things that I know that they don't really teach well I'm just gonna pretty much just continue to do my you know I'm, I'm really like Hebrews I 
I read it before, but I really wanted to read it again and just to like to get more understanding of this. And so, you know, God had pretty much reminded me like that he had he had put it on my heart some time ago to study the sanctuary. And I had started, but then I put it down. And not because I didn't want to study anymore. I just, I tend to, when I'm studying different things, like as the Lord's showing me different things and revealing different things to me, I kind of go down this road. Now I go down that road, like, oh, okay, let me say this. Let me say that. And I kind of like jump around. And so I didn't continue. So he had reminded me that I needed to get back to that. So um, I want with that, I had that question. And so I just started like, okay, let me go through Hebrews more like, like I want to go through it and just kind of slowly go through, take notes and get an understanding of what, because I noticed in Hebrews, it talks a lot about Jesus being, you know, our high priest, like what his work of intercession is in Hebrews. And so that goes, I think, right hand in hand with the sanctuary message. So just those, that's right now, like what I'm trying to focus on specifically Hebrews and just to understand. And I think it's be, maybe because of my sin and my like, like you're saying, like you have that separation and you feel that kind of darkness that like, like discouragement, loss of hope. I'm sure that that's probably the foundation of it. Like, and the more as I understand Jesus and what he's doing, then maybe that will help dispel a lot of that. Can I say something briefly? Yeah. Um, yes. Lavinia, I just want to encourage you because I know that the way that he's going in the beginning, the way he was sharing with you um, was not in your mind it, you know, right away thinking this is the same answer to the question. But I've, my experience has been, as I've been learning the truth about who Christ is and the heavenly father, um, I've had strength begin to enter me and a strong connection, like, mm. a strong, like a wire between me and God that's, that's not mm. been there. I, I've always felt that my relationship was rather fragile um we didn't even say it's a wire that's wireless <laughs> yeah it's it, it's really been a, a, a better connection mm -hmm. um and, and i know how you and i are alike in that we both have been you know sin conscious sensitive conscious yeah. wanting to do right wanting to be mm -hmm. right with god have a relationship but I'm, right. I'm just sharing you that my experience is that this is the way to go. This is the path that will actually take you there. I believe uh, yeah. that, like you're saying, path and, and connection, it's resting heavily on understanding who he is from what is is expressing the word of God is what he say is and not what someone told you or you're rearing at home or what the church say going back to exactly what the words say and deriving the understanding from what those words mean and mm -hmm. all right if you go to John 3 16 and follow into 17, and I did this with Lorraine the other day. There's no way that you can feel that you can't be saved or you're in total outcast. It it doesn't add up. Those words can never bring you to that. And once you have that comfort, I mean. Mm -hmm. When he give you grace, yeah. it's not grace unto sin. It's grace to give you power that you can overcome that same temptation of sin. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that strength um, that we need. 
the connection that's not broken, stronger bond. And so that strength comes back to understanding that his word is exactly what it says. You can read it. Yeah, I think you have enough time to do it before. For, it starts. for okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his, not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it's no condemnation. He doing everything possible to settle your mind and say, look, he, he already know you sin. He, that's why he went to Adam and Eve and said, where are you? Mm -hmm. It was a trial being taken place in the court of the garden. And instead of he saying, look, we made a mistake. I don't know what kind of plan you got, but I need you to help me out with this. He took it in his own hand and decided that I'm just going to try to weasel my way out of this. And he started casting, uh, like, you gave me this woman and I did that. And he pushed the blame to off of him instead of reconcile your behavior by saying, look, that was me. I didn't want to do it, but I lost faith. I didn't, you know, losing faith in me, you don't believe the word. And belief is not just coming out of your mouth. It's an action word. So it's a behavior behind it. Mm -hmm. When you put all of that in the mix, you realize I really didn't really believe what I was reading. I have a weakness here or something. You're able to see where that road is forking off so you can now go back to the scriptures to find what's needed for you to grab a hold of when those type of situation come mm -hmm. Amen. absolutely and that's one thing that i know the lord has shown me recently um, and he confirmed it for me that he was truly speaking that I, his word is sure. And that that's the only thing that's going to get me through yes. and give me the strength and everything that I need, like is really holding on to and understanding his word. You'd be surprised about that. Cause I know they, gave us a lot of this doom and gloom kind of thing and that was something i read recently here that has something to do with the time of trouble and mm -hmm. it's not telling you that ain't no doom and gloom is happening but it's saying that if you stay in his word he gonna find a space for you in the most hope um secret place that you're gonna be able to go through it uh, i don't know how much time we have left on this Call, but I wanted to share something regarding what you're saying. Do we have a few more? How much more do we have? It's got less than a minute, but I guess oh. I can start it so you can finish that. Oh, okay. 